Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 19, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14. What I am forced to tell you about today is grave and urgent beyond description. I believe you have a right and a need to know about it, and yet I already know that in all likelihood you will not believe me when I tell you because it is something no one wants to believe. I've wrestled with this thing, wondering how best to tell you what you must be told, but all I can say is that it is absolutely true beyond any shadow of a doubt. I stake my entire life and my reputation on this fact. If there were any doubt at all about what I am about to reveal, I would not reveal it. At this very moment the United States of America is teetering on the precipice of a devastating nuclear surprise attack, the likes of which the world has never seen. If the detailed plans for war that I have already told you about are carried out, as discussed especially in my monthly AUDIO LETTERS No. 6, 12, and 13, this attack might not come for as much as another year or even more, but that is a very big if, because the capability for this attack is now in place, and it includes provisions for a Soviet double-cross of their allies, the four Rockefeller Brothers, who now rule America behind the scenes. Today I want to alert you to the terrible threat we face by means of these topics. Topic No. 1. The Soviet Missile Crisis of 1976 Topic No. 2. Hitler's Pattern for America's Bicentennial Era and Topic No. 3, The Plans for America's Future Under Occupation and Dictatorship Topic No. 1 It was a sleepy Sunday morning in Hawaii nearly 35 years ago when World War II came to America. Much of the Pacific Fleet of the United States Navy was peacefully at anchor suspecting nothing while President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his closest advisors far away in Washington, D.C., waited anxiously for the attack to occur as planned. At 7.55 a.m. on that peaceful Sunday morning, December 7, 1941, more than 100 Japanese aircraft suddenly appeared in the skies over the island of Oahu, Hawaii. All attempts to warn the Navy of the impending attack had been thwarted or delayed, and the bottled-up American fleet was torn to shreds as a result of the complete surprise that resulted. FDR and his closest advisors had made sure that no aircraft carriers were caught in the raid because these would be indispensable in the retaliation to come against Japan. Instead, the sacrifice was limited to battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and several thousand American servicemen's lives. Soon the news of the crushing disaster that had befallen the United States Navy flashed across a stunned and unbelieving America, and the words Pearl Harbor from that day have been a synonym for surprise attack of the most catastrophic variety. It should also bring to mind high treason and intrigue because while most Americans were trying to recover from the shock and horror of the Pearl Harbor attack, FDR and his Rockefeller bosses were congratulating themselves on the success of the operation. The United States would now be drawn into the war against Hitler, enabling a Rockefeller takeover of the formerly British oil concessions in Saudi Arabia. Yet President Roosevelt would be making good on his campaign promises not to send American boys away to die in a foreign war. Instead, he had arranged to get us into war by allowing several thousand American boys to die in a rigged attack on American territory, Pearl Harbor. His renowned Day of Infamy speech 
then galvanized the nation overnight into a fighting mood. The obstacle of American isolationist sentiment had been flattened, and the United States was at war. Today we are once again at the mercy of an imminent Pearl Harbor type attack. As before, we are being given no warning whatever that this is the case, aside from the general level of tensions here and abroad, but this time it has been planned to be far worse, because this time the plan is not for America to win the war but to lose it. Two months ago in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 I first revealed the existence of the super-secret Nuclear Safe Zone, a swath across roughly the upper half of the continental United States between the latitudes of 40 and 50 degrees north. According to secret agreements between the Rockefeller Brothers and their Soviet allies, this zone is supposed to be spared from the all-out thermonuclear war that is planned to engulf the southern half of the United States in NUCLEAR WAR ONE. This arrangement has three purposes. First, as I revealed two months ago, it provides a zone within which the Rockefeller Brothers and their closest collaborators expect to ride out the coming NUCLEAR WAR ONE in safety and comfort. Second, much of the industrial base and agricultural breadbasket of America will be preserved for exploitation after the war. A third factor, which I did not mention before, has to do with a high-altitude jet stream which goes clear around the earth. Should the Soviets find it necessary to back up their so-called clean bombs, which I revealed last month, with the older dirty bombs, they don't want radioactive fallout from America to drift around the Earth and land on the Soviet Union. More than 95% of the Soviet Union lies north of the 40th parallel of latitude, so by agreeing with the Rockefeller Brothers to strike America only below that latitude except for a small strike against Alaska, the Soviets have avoided the danger of having much radioactive dust from America circle the globe to land on their own country. But the Soviets are very eager to break free of the Rockefeller control under which they have functioned for so long, and they are preparing a double-cross. As I reported last month in Monthly AUDIO LETTERS No. 13, the Safe Zone Agreement has been violated by the placement of an atomic bomb at Seal Harbor, Maine to blast the summer homes of Nelson and David Rockefeller off the map. But that, I am sorry to report, is only the beginning of the Pearl Harbor the Soviets have prepared for us. The Soviet double-cross of the Rockefeller Brothers is to be thorough and complete, and it will include several more violations of their nuclear safe zone, an acceptable price in Soviet eyes for breaking free of the Rockefellers and into the position of absolute world supremacy themselves. While the United States has focused its missile development on long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Soviet Union has never forgotten the potentialities of shorter-range missiles which are easier to design and build. That's what the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962 was all about. The Soviets not wishing to depend on their long-range missiles, had installed much shorter-range missiles in Cuba, able to reach many American cities from the vulnerable South. And when President John F. Kennedy spoiled the Rockefeller Soviet plans by forcing Nikita Khrushchev to remove them, they did not abandon this idea. Instead, JFK was removed from the scene himself and his replacement, Rockefeller puppet President John Lyndon B. Johnson, handed the Soviets a new site for the emplacement of medium-range missiles to threaten the United States from the south. This was done by turning over the huge United States-built McKinsey Airfield to the newly independent Marxist Republic of Guyana. The Americans pulled out. McKinsey Airfield was renamed uh, the Tamara Airfield 
and this new air base, the largest in Central or South America, was then fortified by ringing it with nuclear missiles aimed at the Panama Canal and cities in the southern half of the United States. And as I have been reporting for over two years, without any government investigation of my charges whatsoever, the missiles in Guyana are at operational readiness today threatening the United States and the Panama Canal. But that's not all, my friends. Five years ago in 1971 there was another Soviet missile crisis, this time involving both Canada and the United States, and I am here revealing it for the very first time. The Soviet Missile Crisis of 1971 began with an accidental discovery by some divers off Vancouver Island, Canada. A Vancouver fishing trawler had sunk in the area and divers were sent down to locate it. While they were looking, they came across something unbelievable, a missile anchored to the bottom. It was attached by heavy chains to four concrete blocks, each estimated to weigh five tons. The blocks in turn were anchored to the bottom by extra heavy anchors of Soviet design. The divers reported their unexpected find immediately, and the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, went into action. The Canadian ship HCMS Ritsugushi plus two mine layers and a torpedo boat were dispatched and immediately covered the area. By coincidence, this chance discovery occurred just as the Soviet Navy was launching its own operation to recover that very missile. Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko had just arrived to visit Vancouver for a hush-hush Foreign Minister's Conference ostensibly. Strangely, he arrived aboard the Soviet ship Sularov, a heavy cruiser of the Cresta class, but Gromyko explained that away by saying that he had just been inspecting the Soviet fleet which was on maneuvers, but that was just a cover story. A Soviet oceanographic research ship doing underwater experiments on guided missiles near Sakhalin had reached the conclusion that six guided missiles which had been placed strategically on the seabed around the North American continent years before would now have to be recovered and removed at once. These had been planted on the orders of Khrushchev after his defeat by President Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and for years they had been lurking undetected, but now they would have to be removed because the Soviet experiments at Sakhalin had revealed that the metals used in the missiles were proving unstable and had started disintegrating rapidly in the salt water. The situation was very serious not only because the missiles were no longer dependable as weapons, but also because corrosion of the warheads could have led to leakage of radioactive materials or even, under certain conditions, uncontrolled explosions. This was the real reason for Gromyko's strange visit to Vancouver aboard the heavy cruiser Suvorov in 1971. The Soviet Navy, in reality, was invading the territorial waters of Canada to recover a malfunctioning weapon, the underwater missile. But due to the accidental discovery of the missile by the Canadian divers, Gromyko's mission was foiled. He stayed there for three days aboard the ship and then was aghast to see the Soviet missile go past him on a barge on the way to Dockside. Gromyko immediately canceled his appearance in Vancouver and sailed for home without delay. The missile itself was rushed by a special airplane immediately to a secret location in the United States for study and analysis. The Vancouver discovery also triggered an intensive search of all the American and Canadian coasts by specially equipped surface and underwater vessels. This search turned up three more such miss missiles, one off the coast of California and Oregon, another just south of San Rosero, Baja, California, and a third one off the coast of Maine, just east of a rocky island there. Two additional underwater missiles were known to exist as well, 
One was believed to be somewhere in the Ark from Cuba to Pensacola, Florida. The other was thought to be in the Caribbean Islands aimed at the Panama Canal. These last two were never found by the United States Navy, but the pattern of activity of the Soviet Navy indicated that they were successfully recovered by the Soviets. The Soviets had been poised to mount a recovery operation for all six missiles, but were prevented from making any such attempt because of the intensive United States Navy search. Each of the four missiles which were recovered by the joint Canadian-American effort was examined and its targets determined. It turned out that each missile was fitted with multiple warheads. The one discovered by the divers off Vancouver had six targets, the Royal Canadian Naval Base on Vancouver Island, the Port of Vancouver, the Port of Seattle, and three Boeing aircraft plants in Seattle, Everett, and Blaine. The missile found off the coast of Oregon in California had its multiple warheads targeted on five centers in the San Francisco Bay Area. The San Rosario missile was targeted on the United States Naval Base of San Diego and on the City of Los Angeles. As for the missile found in the waters off the coast of Maine, its targets were Boston, the submarine base in Connecticut, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and the New York Harbor. The missile, which was apparently retrieved by the Soviets in the Cuba-Pensacola area, was assumed to have been aimed at strategic coastal targets in the southeast. And so ended the Soviet Missile Crisis of 1971. In some respects it was even more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis nine years earlier because the underwater missiles off our shores were already operational whereas those in Cuba were stopped just short of operational status. But you've never heard a word about the Soviet Missile Crisis of 1971. This is because that would not have squared well with our official policy of so-called détente with the Soviet Union. The Rockefeller agents in our government knew all about the missiles and had a ticklish job keeping the lid on after the accidental discovery by the Vancouver divers brought NORAD and the United States Navy into the picture. All's well that ends well, or so it seems, but this just wasn't the end of the Soviet Missile Crisis. On February 11, 1971, the same year in which the Soviet Missile Crisis occurred, 63 nations signed a treaty prohibiting the installation of nuclear weapons on the seabed beyond any nation's 12-mile coastal zone. On top of that, the United States over the past dozen years has laid down a grid of electronic sensing wires and cables on the ocean floor all along both our Pacific and Atlantic coasts, making the seabed look like a giant spider web. These detection nets, called SOSUS for the Atlantic and CSER for the Pacific, are tied into computers which enable any submarine passing over them, American or foreign, to be detected, located and even identified in a very short time. So what could happen? My friends, the Maginot Line did not protect the French from invasion in World War II. The Germans went right over it. In the same way, the Rockefeller Brothers have enabled the Soviets to go over our underwater detection nets as if they did not exist. When President Richard M. Nixon arrived in Moscow on May 22, 1972, for summit talks with the Kremlin, he had more to discuss than the highly publicized SALT talks. A key agreement arrived at then established joint oceanographic projects with the Soviets, and since that time Soviet oceanographic vessels have been in and out of our territorial waters continuously. For approximately two years these vessels operate in a totally innocent appearing fashion while actually gathering information on optimum placement sites for a new fleet of underwater missiles along our shores. By the time the Joint Army-Navy teams monitoring the underwater nets had become accustomed to the Soviet oceanographic ships as a routine, non-threatening presence in our waters, the Soviets were ready to act. Under cover of oceanographic operations, the Soviets began planting underwater missiles along our shores once again, 
plus several strategically located atomic bombs, and as if they needed it, the Soviets have also slipped in through a loophole in the 1971 Treaty which superficially seems to ban such weaponry in our coastal waters. Most if not all of these weapons have been planted inside our 12-mile territorial limit whereas the treaty only forbids such things beyond that limit. This is a chilling echo of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's promises to avoid a foreign war before World War II only to help rig an attack on our own territory. But the Soviets, having been given the oceanographic cover they needed in order to get the bombs and missiles into our coastal waters, have already double-crossed their Rockefeller allies. Not only have the Rockefeller Brothers themselves been marked for destruction as signaled by the bomb at Seal Harbor, Maine, but their precious nuclear-safe zone has already been breached by the Soviets in at least three other places where missiles have been placed contrary to their agreement with the Rockefellers. The Soviets, like the Rockefeller Brothers themselves, are now going for broke. They are trying to arrange in every way they can to break the back of any conceivable retaliation or resistance by the United States in the coming war. It is still in the Soviet interest to minimize warfare within the nuclear safe zone, but specific targets will be attacked within this zone whenever the Soviets consider it necessary to achieve their goal of total victory and total world domination over the United States. I can now reveal that the coastal waters of the United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, and the Panama Canal Zone, now contain at least ten multiple warhead, short-range, underwater launch missiles of a new advanced design. In addition, at least four atomic bombs have been strategically placed in harbor areas. Here is the situation as it now stands according to my own latest intelligence sources. First, the four bombs. One is the bomb I was able to reveal last month, which is placed at Seal Harbor, Maine, to destroy the summer homes of David and Nelson Rockefeller. The second is planted in the Potomac River near the United States Naval Ordnance Station at Indian Head, Maryland. The third is in the Mississippi River upstream from New Orleans in the vicinity of Benet Carey Spillway and Floodway, and the fourth atomic bomb has been planted in the port of Valdez, Alaska, which is the southern terminus of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. By rendering the Port of Valdez useless, of course, the pipeline will be put out of action since oil tankers are supposed to carry the oil from the pipeline delivery point at Valdez to destinations in the lower United States. As for the short-range multiple warhead Soviet missiles which once again infest our coastal waters, three violate the nuclear safe zone. One is in Boston Harbor. The second is in Long Island Sound, about midway between New York City and the submarine base at New London, Connecticut, and the third is in the Seattle-Vancouver area, situated between Victoria, British Columbia on the north and the Port Angeles or Sequim, Washington area on the south. Outside the nuclear safe zone, Missile No. 4 is in Chesapeake Bay east of Washington, D.C. No. 5 is located just offshore from Pensacola, Florida. A sixth missile has been planted in Galveston Bay, Texas. A seventh lies just offshore of San Diego, California, while Missile No. 8 is deep inside San Pablo Bay near San Francisco. The ninth missile is located in the Atlantic Ocean near the north entrance to the Panama Canal. And finally, Missile No. 10, with tragic irony, is poised in the Pacific Ocean near the entrance to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The exact location of the Pearl Harbor missile 
is longitude 157 degrees 58 minutes 58 seconds, latitude 21 degrees 18 minutes 28 seconds. All the Navy needs to do is to look, and do it now, before the Soviets have time to sneak in and move it, and they'll find this missile. I respectfully urge, no, I demand, that the Joint Chiefs of Staff immediately take such actions as are required to remove the deadly missiles which now menace the United States and Vancouver, Canada from our own territorial waters. The things I have just revealed are true, my friends, and I urge you to add your challenge to mine. I stand ready to cooperate fully with the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the new larger Soviet missile crisis we are now in. Will the Joint Chiefs act? If they do not do so, and soon, then they themselves will have violated their oath to protect and safeguard our Constitution, our nation, our lives, and the lives of generations to come. Topic No. 2. I comment often about the covert alliance that exists between the corporate socialists headed by the four Rockefeller brothers in America and the Communist bosses of the Soviet Union. It is essential that this relationship be understood, even though the day is fast approaching when the Soviets plan to end it by means of a double cross. But it is also important to grasp the fact that the Rockefellers are not themselves Communists. To them, Communism is just a very convenient and powerful tool, a stepping stone to power. They don't themselves subscribe to any rigid ideology, Communist or otherwise. Their only real doctrine is that of domination and control, along with destruction of everything and anyone they cannot control. In this they bear a striking resemblance to just one man, Adolf Hitler. What we have today is a blend of emerging Fascism, which is a combination of state control with monopolistic capitalism and socialism of the Marxist variety, all wrapped up in American packaging and sold to us by means of Rockefeller public relations propaganda. Our would-be dictators realize full well that if they were to dress up in combat fatigues get up on a high balcony and rant and rave about the need for the state to control our lives totally, we would all recognize them right away for what they are, and their schemes would fail. Instead, they wear nice business suits, use cleverly worded phrases that seem to say exactly what we want to hear, and make sure that they smile a great deal. And instead of swaying great crowds in a public square from a high balcony, they can now cajole and mislead whole nations from the matchless high balcony of television. In Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 1, June 1975, I mentioned the role played by the Rockefeller Empire in providing the support Adolf Hitler needed in order to rise to power in Germany. They supported him, watched him, and learned from him. In the late 1920s, the Rockefellers had succeeded in wrestling control of the German dye and drug cartel IG Farben Industry AG away from the British. This, plus an ongoing rivalry between Britain and the Rockefellers over oil, led the British to institute boycott tactics preventing the Rockefeller Standard Oil interests from exploiting the vast Saudi Arabian oil concessions on which the Rockefellers had pried loose from the British during World War I. The Rockefeller solution? Confront Britain with a threat, great enough to break Britain's Saudi Arabian oil boycott. When 22-year-old Nelson Rockefeller returned from his around-the-world honeymoon trip in 1930, he convinced his father, John D. Rockefeller, Jr., that the solution to their problems lay in one Adolf Hitler. Not many Germans really took Hitler seriously in 1930, but the Rockefellers did. Having observed Hitler at close range, they were convinced that Hitler could serve the Rockefeller purpose well. Hitler was obviously bent on conquest and war, so providing the support he needed to achieve power 
would produce a very real menace to Britain in due course, just the right medicine to cure Britain of her Saudi Arabian boycott against the Rockefeller oil interests. Hitler was especially attractive for Rockefeller purposes for one additional reason beyond his sheer aggressiveness. His earlier failure and imprisonment had taught Hitler a very important lesson, which the Rockefellers themselves had also learned decades before, namely that successful revolutions are best carried out with and not against the full power of a nation's government. In other words, Hitler had concluded that the best way to achieve his goals would be to first acquire control of the government through means which were legal, at least in appearance, and then to carry out the revolutionary changes he desired. Therefore, by supporting Hitler and watching to see how he went about the details of his takeover and revolution, the Rockefellers stood to learn valuable lessons for their own use later on. This was a very nice bonus for the Rockefellers, so support for Hitler through covert channels began immediately, and from 1930 onward Hitler's star rose rapidly. At the same time, the Rockefellers had to make sure that they would be in a position to check Hitler's advance when he had served his purpose, which was to frighten the British Government into surrendering control over Saudi Arabia. In other words, a balance of power had to be maintained so that Hitler would not get out of control. For this reason, and as well as others, uh, Rockefeller's support for Hitler was counterbalanced by support also for the man who, as President, would have the job of getting America into the war to stop Hitler, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR had staged a political comeback from his crippling attack on polio, uh, of polio several years before, but it was about from 1930 onward uh, that FDR's political star rose rapidly on the national scene, paralleling the rise of Hitler in Germany. Throughout their period on the world stage, the careers of Hitler and FDR paralleled one another. Both came to power early in 1933, and both uh, proposed sweeping changes in rapid fashion that differed widely from their campaign pledges. Both exercised unprecedented power during their terms in office, and both died in April 1945, less than three weeks apart, as the war in Europe was ending. The dual role of the Rockefellers throughout can be illustrated, for example, by the actions of Nelson Rockefeller. In 1935 he became a director of the Creole Petroleum Company in Venezuela, a subsidiary of Rockefeller-owned Standard Oil of New Jersey. Creole was a principal avenue through which the Nazi war machine was provided with the essential fuel without which war could not have been waged, and for seven years, 1937 through 1943, Creole Petroleum shipped 90% of its Venezuelan oil production to Germany in Nazi tankers, only a token 10% going to the United States. In this way, the Rockefeller Empire, increasingly dominated by Nelson, David, Lawrence, and John D. III, provided Hitler with over 65 million barrels of oil each year from the Venezuelan oil fields alone well into the World War II. In 1940, Nelson resigned his Directorship of Creole Petroleum to become Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs by appointment of Rockefeller Puppet President FDR. As Coordinator, uh, Nelson was supposedly feverishly at work to combat the Nazi uh, menace in this hemisphere, the very menace that was being sustained by oil, oil provided by his Creole Petroleum Company. Through Hitler, the Rockefellers did at last bring Great Britain to her knees and a great deal was learned from the plan Hitler followed that is being followed again today by the four Rockefeller brothers. Hitler had two very important rules for exercising power. One was to use the masses by means of effective propaganda, leading them to accept and do things which they normally would not. The other rule was to make sure that any lies were big lies, so big that no one could believe they were lies coming from their leader. Those same principles are being used today in updated and very smooth ways by the Rockefeller Brothers and their agents. Hitler's rise to power was made possible by an era of inflation, shortages, and then depression. 
The same conditions are being brought about deliberately here in America in order to help achieve the same end result, a revolution and dictatorship. While Hitler was in prison, he began writing Mein Kampf, which means My Struggle. In it and in his speeches Hitler made it clear what he would do if he ever acquired the power to do it. In a similar vein we can read The American Rich, published 1930 by Rockefeller Advisor Hoffman Nickerson, The New Federalism by Nelson Rockefeller, The Emerging Constitution, published in 1974 by Rexford Tugwell, quietly revealing a dictatorial new Constitution which was written to match a secret outline provided by Nelson Rockefeller himself or the Bicentennial Declaration Advertisements published nationwide in 1975 by John D. Rockefeller III's National Committee for the Bicentennial Era. The last item could have been titled a Bicentennial Manifesto, since a manifesto is nothing more than a public declaration of intentions, motives, or views. But everyone now knows that the Communist Manifesto of a century ago was no joke, so that word was avoided. But keep in mind what Hitler said in January 1941, quote, It is nonsense for the rest of the world to pretend today that I did not reveal this program until 1933 or 1935 or 1937. Instead of listening to foolish chatter, these gentlemen would have been wiser to read what I have written and rewritten thousands of times. No human being has declared or recorded what he wanted more often than I." Unquote. If the four Rockefeller brothers are allowed to succeed in their diabolical plans, they too will be in a position to indict us in practically the same words. Hitler directed much of his appeal to the new generation, young people who had grown up in an abnormal time lacking normal roots and values, and who were therefore more vulnerable to being misled and used. The introduction of the 18-year-old vote, regardless of its actual effect, was intended for a similar purpose here in America. Hitler pursued a policy of legality, strictly as a tactic, in his campaign to take control of the German Government. In every respect Hitler was challenging the authority of the State under the Weimar Constitution, yet he camouflaged this challenge by using fair-sounding words. The same thing is happening once again here today. The words we hear in the Presidential Campaign, for example, such as a new world framework for peace, governmental reorganization, interdependence. But the meaning of these words involve world government, surrender of United States sovereignty, and suspension or replacement of the United States Constitution. But why, you may ask, do they bother to leave any clues at all like this if they're trying to be devious? Why don't they just lie outright? The answer is simply that it is harder to lie convincingly than to tell the truth, and if one starts telling actual lies, it becomes harder and harder over a period of time to keep track of what has been said before, and eventually one makes mistakes which can be detected. So instead they tell a little bit of truth, but always in such a way that you won't understand it unless you are very alert. Hitler realized that his policy of legality could only lead to success in one way. That was to gain access to the position of Chancellor and use the emergency powers of the President under the Weimar Constitution. This was true because, try as he might, Hitler was never able to achieve majority popular support for himself or his Nazi Party. And today our would-be dictator Nelson Rockefeller, who has also been frustrated in his attempts to gain majority popular support nationally, is also trying to position himself to seize control by means of emergency presidential powers. David Rockefeller's agent Jimmy Carter, meanwhile, whose build-up has been used to impress Ford with Rockefeller power, also stands ready in case Nelson's illness should overcome him. In 1936 Hitler said, quote, It is not enough to overthrow the old state, but that the new state must previously have been built up and be practically ready to one's hand. In 1933 it was no longer a question of overthrowing a state by an act of violence. Meanwhile the new state had been built up, and all that there remained to do 
was to destroy the last remnants of the old State, and that took but a few hours." Unquote. So it is that the Rockefeller Brothers are rapidly getting the governmental machinery into place, which is to go into full operation under their dictatorial new Constitution for the quote, New States of America." Unquote. Shortly before Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, he said to then-Chancellor Bruning, quote, Herr Chancellor, if the German nation once empowers the National Socialist Movement to introduce a Constitution other than that which we have today, then you cannot stop it." Unquote. On September 12, 1975, Nelson Rockefeller displayed exactly the same thinking during a news conference in Dallas, Texas. In response to criticisms leveled at him as our appointed Vice President by a columnist, Rockefeller's answer was, quote, Well, he's got one, so there's nothing he can do about it." Unquote. On August 9, 1974, our last elected President, Richard Nixon, became the first in American history to resign, hounded out of office by means of the Watergate scandal. Listen now to the following words taken from a conspirator's diary, and I quote, For him alone winter seems to have arrived. He is being secretly undermined and is already completely isolated. He is anxiously looking for collaborators. Our mice are busily at work gnawing through the last supports of his position." Unquote. Those words could have been written about Watergate with complete accuracy, but they were not. They were written by Hitler's Propaganda Chief, Paul Joseph Goebbels, twelve days before Chancellor Bruning was forced to resign on May 30, 1932. Bruning was succeeded by an interim Chancellor more to Hitler's liking, Franz von Papen, and Hitler himself replaced von Papen on January 30, 1933, when Hitler was appointed Chancellor by aging President von Hindenburg under the provisions of the Weimar Constitution. It was this weakness of the Weimar Constitution, the fact that the Chancellor was appointed, not elected, that enabled Hitler to succeed in his plan to take control of Germany by legal means despite his lack of majority popular support. This lesson was not lost on Nelson Rockefeller, who introduced exactly the same weakness into the United States Constitution for his own benefit by means of the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment was proposed a scant three weeks after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy by Nelson Rockefeller's water boy, Birch Bayh, almost as if it had been ready and waiting. Immediately after becoming Chancellor, Hitler forced new elections. His election campaign promised nothing at all, but instead simply ran down the failures of the past. Hitler said simply, Give us four years. Meanwhile, he assured his supporters that these would actually be the last elections to be expected for ten, perhaps even a hundred years. Terrorism and lawlessness mushroomed during the campaign culminating in the Reichstag fire just a few days before the elections. This pretext was used to suspend individual liberties as guaranteed by the Weimar Constitution, enabling the Nazis to take any actions they pleased against their political opponents. Following the election and the suppression of all effective opposition, Hitler forced the passage of the infamous Enabling Law, the foundation of Hitler's dictatorship. This gave the Chancellor the right to make laws without the cooperation of the Reichstag for a period of four years. Now, after it was too late, it became clear what Hitler had meant in his campaign theme, just give us four years. Hitler's enabling law gave him the power to rule by fiat, which is the power of dictatorship. To enact a law as dictator without the concurrence of the Reichstag the Chancellor had only to write a law and publish it, and in exactly the same way the President of the United States can and does make law without any action by Congress in the form of executive orders. These laws, signed by the President himself, 
become law simply by being published in the Federal Register. Since March 1933 we have been technically in a continuous condition of national emergency, and many governmental powers have been usurped by American Presidents under this condition over the past 43 years. But every time a major new phase is entered, there is a fresh declaration of national emergency. In Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 10 four months ago I alerted you to the fact that plans are now progressing rapidly toward implementing Executive Order 11490, signed by President Nixon nearly seven years ago, to provide in detail for a total government takeover of all activities in a declared emergency. And on June 11, 1976, just last month, President Ford signed a new Executive Order 11921 very quietly, which updates the older Executive Order and shifts the emphasis heavily in the direction of post-attack conditions as we near the outbreak of war. It places heavy emphasis on procedures relating to nuclear, biological, and chemical hazards of the sort introduced into our environment by the planned war. It provides for the establishment, not the preservation, of an economy for the nation. It provides for sweeping controls on that all-important resource, water, which is to be controlled and allocated by the Federal Government. This is the outcome of the Little Notice National Commission on Water Quality which was started by Nelson Rockefeller at the same time as his better known Commission on Critical Choices. My friends, write to your Congressman in demand that he send you a copy of the Federal Register for June 15, 1976, and read for yourself the 44 pages of detailed provisions for the national emergency which is planned for all of us. If possible, this will be brought into play in the wake of oil shortages and other disruptions generated in the wake of a Mideast war, but the thrust of Executive Order 11921, just signed by Ford, has to do with the aftermath of nuclear attack. The pattern, my friends, is unmistakable. After Hitler achieved power, he progressively consolidated it by eliminating opposition political parties ending independent local government and replacing it with agents of his Federal Government, enforcing his will by means of his secret police and spies, disposing of troublesome elements by means of concentration camps, and using Germany as a springboard for war to conquer other nations as well. If the Rockefeller brothers succeed in their plans, the United States of America will soon witness a replay of Hitlerism brought up to date and made more repressive and horrible than ever by those who used Hitler for their own purposes. Topic No. 3 If nuclear war one is permitted to take place as planned on American soil, perhaps you will survive it. Many will not, but some will. But if you do survive, what sort of future do you and your trusting children have to look forward to? My friends, whether or not the Rockefellers are double-crossed by their Soviet allies, the aftermath of Nuclear War I promises to be slavery for you and all your loved ones. If the Rockefeller brothers somehow find a way to prevent a double-cross by the Soviets, then the war will proceed as planned for the benefit of the Rockefellers. Half of America's population will be consumed in nuclear blasts a thousand times hotter than the ovens of Hitler. Those who are left will be given the task of rebuilding America along the patterns dictated by the Rockefeller Brothers. A once free people, reduced to slave labor, shipped like cattle to one area to rebuild a bombed-out power dam, to another area to work in uranium mines to still another area to work the agricultural lands owned by the huge agribusinesses owned by the Rockefellers and their collaborators. If the Rockefellers are double-crossed, the death toll during the war itself may be even higher, but the results afterward will be no different. Instead of living under a Rockefeller dictatorship, 
we will exist under Soviet occupation whose characteristics will be practically the same. And so, my friends, the choice between the Rockefeller Brothers and their Soviet allies is no choice at all. If these things are allowed to come to pass, and the final link in the chain reaction that is to begin with general war in the Middle East, then the life that will be left to us and our little ones will not be worth living. That is why, for my part, I would rather speak the truth now in the hope that we may yet turn to a third choice, the saving of our free country from war and dictatorship while it can still be done. The lesson of history is that this cannot be done, that like countless peoples before us, we will refuse to see the truth, believe it, and act on it in time to save ourselves. That is how most Germans reacted to Adolf Hitler in the early 1930s, and that is how most Americans are still behaving today. But 200 years ago a small band of very wise men defied the rules of history and created a government that freed men as no government had done in 5,000 years, the United States of America. And you and I can redeem this priceless heritage. We too can and must defy history in the same way by saving the unique heritage that is ours. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.